And for our penultimate talk, let's be serious. It gets down to measuring again. You can't really measure, you can't really monetize, but you can't measure. And I, in my years in the API industry, I think the hardest aspect of APIs is monetization. So Derek, can you teach us the way, lead us? Awesome, and thanks for uh, having us here on uh, API Days. Uh, today, I'm gonna be chatting about the best practices when monetizing an API platform. Um, how do you think about that business model and the right ways for measurement? Uh, before jumping into things, a little overview of myself. I'm the co-founder and CEO of MOSIF, the leading API analytics platform. My focus is on API strategy, monetizing APIs, and also things around analytics. I also love IPAs, so you can find me many times at Zeitgeist over in uh, San Francisco, although I do hear it's uh, uh, flooding these days, so hopefully uh, it's going to do a little better. Why are we talking about monetizing APIs? Well, selling to developers is hard. You know, There's no single developer persona you can go target. Many times you run into not invented here syndrome. Um, developers are, are always leery of talking to sales and marketing teams. And they have a constant stream of different prior, higher priority tasks. The most important piece here is that developers can build it themselves. So it's really important for us to show value as quick as possible in the, with the lowest amount of obstacles in the way. And what are some of those obstacles that developers run into? Well, first of all, you have legal and security teams. You know, you have to make sure this new tool that they're going to adopt, you know, passes all compliance requirements. You know, uh, many times uh, legal is going to get involved, redline the enterprise contract. There's a lot of back and forth there. And many developers just don't want to deal with that type of stuff. Um, you have other areas like procurement, right? Onboarding a new vendor can be a process, process in itself. It uh, can be scary for, for new folks who have never gone through that process before. And lastly, you have product priorities. So, you know, if, if a, it's going to take two days or five days to onboard with this new API, you know, does it even make sense? Maybe they could spend more time just building it themselves internally. So our recommendation, especially for certain business models, is to land developers first. What I mean by that is you start with a large bottoms up funnel, get them to pay a small or token amount. And this could be just like hundred bucks a month, maybe it's 10 bucks a month and recognize the value in the platform as quick as possible. So your main uh, metric here is how fast can you get a new developer to pay for your, your platform or your API, even if it's a small amount. When you do that, you're able to skip through many of these obstacles that come about when you deal with normal or, or traditional enterprise sales processes. So for example, instead of redlining a complex enterprise contract, you just have click through terms of service. You sign up, the, the developer enters their email, they're able to get started. You have a nice, beautiful self-service onboarding flow, get them to integrate that API or get started as quick as possible. And they're able to just use their manager's credit card. You know, many managers these days have, you know, some type of discretionary spend, you know, they can plop that tool on their credit card without going through the typical uh, uh, processes around procurement. Once you get that developer paying through that credit card, that's when you can actually start managing an enterprise sales process. So in this case, you can sell through that developer who is on the self-service plan to show additional value. So for example, leadership might come in and say they have additional requirements that might be single sign-on, might be certain additional reporting that they need, uh, it could be additional volumes. Uh, so you can actually increase the uses there. It might be additional teams, new use cases. Uh, integrations, for example, integrating with a Salesforce or integrating, you know, with with a Datadog or other tools that the developer might be already using. Um, those could be ways for you to increase that contract value. But before we uh, uh, think about self-service or this developer first uh, business model, we need to walk through a couple different areas and, and make some decisions here. So, for example, the first thing is, are you going to be doing prepaid or postpaid billing? Are you going to be doing tiered versus pay as you go based billing model? Um, when do you actually invoice? Um, is it threshold based? Is it a, a monthly or quarterly billing model? Um, and then what is that level of support? So we're going to walk through each of these four areas today. First, let's talk about prepaid versus postpaid billing. Um, prepaid is when you're actually paying for that consumption or that usage ahead of time. Um, for those who've gone through the enterprise sales process, this is going to look pretty familiar. 
you're paying for, for that quota or usage, you know, for a year up front, maybe you're paying for it quarterly. Uh, this can uh, heavily increase the cash flow for your business. Um, it's more familiar with folks who have already gone through this process, but does have a few cons with it too. It creates friction in that onboarding process because now you're asking for a developer to be paying for a set of transactions or set of uses before they saw any value. So it requires a lot of investment into your, your trial and your POC process to make sure they're able to see value as quick as possible before that trial expires and have a good playbook there. Um, this is, it can be also harder with pay-as-you-go models. So if you look at a company like Twilio, right, where you're paying for per SMS and it may be just a couple pennies, you know, how do you pay for that usage when you haven't even seen how many transactions or messages you're going to be sent yet? Um, it can also make uh, measurement a little harder. When we go to postpaid billing, this means the customer is not paying for your service until after a certain period of time. This may make uh, uh, onboarding much easier um, because in this case, they're able to integrate, you know, see some value in the platform. Maybe they sent a few messages already, or maybe they're able to get access to API already. Um, so it makes that um, onboarding experience much, much more seamless and easier. It also makes pay as you go easier because now you know the exact amount of usage a developer did within a, a billing period uh, before you go charge that credit card. Um, but there's a big issue with uh, postpaid billing. And that is the credit risk. Just like if you look at your cell phone bill, you know, you can actually do prepaid uh, cell phones versus po postpaid cell phones. And when you usually sign up for a postpaid cell phone bill, you have to run a credit check, right? Because you're literally extending credit to your customer. Um, this can also be right for abuse. You know, if you don't have the right mechanisms to, you know, shut off access, you know, uh, enforce rate limits or quota limits, um, you can have folks who download your entire database, especially if you have a data API, um, before uh, they ever pay for your service. So this is something to keep in mind when you go through this prepaid versus postpaid analysis. A second area you wanna think about is tiered versus pay-as-you-go pricing. Um, tier pricing is something that we see with a lot of traditional SaaS tools. You, know, you might have two or three uh, tiers that a customer can sign up for, and it has a set of uh, packaging with that and a set of different features that you get Maybe there's a, a usage-based component, but you're literally paying for the entire package. One of the pros for this is it enforces a minimum spend. So if you do have you know, some support costs there, you can ensure that at least each developer is paying 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, 500 bucks a month, whatever that uh, uh, threshold is for your business. It's also predictable for customers. Now they can go submit a budget request or a request to get this tool set up and say, hey, I expect it to be costing you know, 100 bucks a month or whatever it is. It's also much easier to implement. It doesn't require a lot of accurate measurement for how many uh, transactions a customer has used or how many API calls a customer has used. Um, and this goes back to the accurate measurement piece uh, that was discussed earlier. In fact, some uh, uh, API first businesses can get started with a you know honor system where they Maybe they keep track of the quota in, 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 in a soft way, right? And then enforce soft limits, reach out to customers who keep breaching those quotas, but at least they don't need to you know, have the accurate measurement in place. One of the cons though, is that it can add friction in expansion. Because sometimes those jumps from one plan to the next plan can be quite significant. And it may take a, a long time for you know, a person to see the, most, the, the value before they make that next jump, right? So what can happen now is you have customers that are in these in-between states. You know, they see, you know, uh, they're getting more usage than the plan that they're on, but they don't see enough value that they're ready to make the jump to the next plan. So now they have to be constantly doing that trade uh, trade off and it can be a turnoff for uh, certain customers. When you move to a pay as you go model, which is sometimes called usage based or consumption based uh, pricing, this means you're pricing on a, a per unit basis. Um, Stripe is a classic example of this, where the pricing on uh, the payment uh, transaction volume, you know, it's a per certain percentage. Twilio is another example of this, where you're paying for a certain number of text matches being sent. And that can be, you know, tr monthly tracked users. It could be number of transactions. It can be in dollars or a percentage of revenue. And one of the pros of this is it makes it a lot more efficient for the customer because they need to only pay for what they get and nothing more. 
So this also makes it a lot easier for uh, for you to have built in an automatic expansion revenue. So now now they can plop in that credit card, don't even think about it. And, and that that monthly bill just gets larger and larger over time as that usage increases. Um, it can also appear cheaper for your customers because, again, they're paying just for what they get. However, there's a huge con for pay to go models. One of the biggest is billing surprises. You don't want a developer to sign up for your API. They're paying 500 bucks a month and the next month they get a $10,000 bill. How do you avoid those types of surprises? Because that's the fastest way for a customer to churn. The second big con is the accurate measurement. You don't want developers coming to you saying, hey, I thought I had you know, 10,000 transactions, but it looks like you're billing me for a million transactions. How do you have that um, easy to understand and also audit? And this goes back to the measurement piece. The third piece to think about is when do you actually invoice and, and uh, uh, charge the customer? Um, you can do a recurring, recurring model. So this might mean you know, you're adding up the, the usage you know, for a particular customer on a monthly basis, maybe it's quarterly, maybe it's yearly, whatever makes sense for your business and whatever makes sense for your customers. One of the pros here is it is easier on the finance team when it comes to recognizing that revenue is more predictable, right? Because now you can expect you to get an invoice every month or every quarter and so on. Um, but it, it can be costly, especially if you have customers that are paying just a couple pennies for your SaaS product. Um, it doesn't even make sense for you to actually go run that invoice. And it can also be complex if it's prepaid. In that case, you don't even know uh, uh, how much you're going to be uh, uh, charging. Um, so, so it's extremely complicated to do prepaid in a recurring uh, invoice model. There's another model they can think about, which is threshold based. And this is used heavily within the ads industry where you have a threshold such as $500 a month. And as soon as that threshold is breached, you go build a customer. You can also do this in a prepaid model where you where you buy a set number of credits ahead of time. Uh, this is used heavily within some, some messaging APIs and telecommunications where you say, hey, I'm just going to you know, buy $10 worth of, of messages and I'm going to burn that credit down. And then when, when it gets to a certain threshold, you can you know, re-up or, 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 or buy more credits. One of the pros of this is it can reduce your transaction costs because now you're not running credit card bills for, for you know, five cents or 10 cents. It also makes prepaid easier. Um, one of the cons though, is it's gonna be much harder for your finance team. Um, what, what month or what period is that revenue really considered? It can also uh, create company liability. Now you have to consider all these folks who have positive balances, you know, and that is technically a liability on the company balance sheet. Lastly, when it comes to you know, self-service or this developer-first uh, monetization strategy, account management can be extremely difficult. It's not scalable, right? Um, you know, customers are gonna run into issues. There's issues during onboarding flows, they're not able to get set up correctly, technical problems, there's changing business needs. You know, they, sit off, they start off with a very specific use case, but then they want more things, you know, more integrations, uh, they want more data or more usage. And there's going to be problems with, you know, payment itself. You know, those billing surprises that I mentioned, especially with the pay as you go model. How do you handle this, but ensure that your, you know, CSM and support teams don't get, uh, you know, uh, overloaded. And there's a couple of things you can be doing within your own developer experience. The first thing is visibility and, and self-service management. Provide direct visibility to, you know, the usage of, the, of uh, their APIs, the usage of their quota, how much have they used? How much have they not used? Even a way for them to slice and dice so they can make their own adjustments to optimize uh, their plan or their subscription quota. The other thing is make it easy for them to you know, manage seats or users, upgrading the plan, anything else that should be self-service, you should be making it self-service. Otherwise, you're going to be uh, you know, overloading those CSM teams, which is easy to manage when you have maybe 10 or 50 enterprise accounts to manage, you know, per person, but, you know, a person can't manage, you know, 10,000 or a hundred thousand developers at the same time. The second thing is, you know, how do you actually avoid these billing surprises? Um, the easiest way to do that is notify customers when they reach certain limits. And this might be, you know, a series of different emails. For example, that first email might be, you know, a softer, lighter touch saying, 
hey, you know, uh, you know, you are getting close to that quota, might be a good time to reevaluate what, what plan makes sense for you. In fact, this is the recommended plan that will save you some money and be a better fit for your needs. Um, and then, you know, if they don't make any decision there, you can then send what I call stronger or more forceful language in those emails. And finally, you know, set it, set up a notification for a CSM rep to actually reach out to a customer and understand why did they not take action. And this means you need to have those workflows in place so you can preempt those discussions, be more proactive when it comes to supporting your customers. If you do have the pay as you go model where you, there is no specific quota in mind, allow your customers to set their own quota, empower them to, to manage their own costs and say, hey, you know, I care about when, when my monthly bill is gonna be around $1,000 a month, that's when I should be thinking about upgrading or, or reevaluating re -evaluating this plan. Another thing you can be thinking about is friction with uh, the uh, payment itself, right? It's great to get a manager to pay for your tool, but you know, managers, you know, leave the company, they move around. Um, there are credit limits on these uh, credit cards. Um, so one thing you can do is think about different billing partners. You know, for example, Amazon Marketplace, Azure Marketplace, and other marketplaces like that, where you can be basically a pre-approved vendor in another line item on their Amazon bill. Many times with Amazon, I think they even have uh, uh, ways for you to uh, have a predefined amount of credits that can be burned down, which is advantageous for both yourself and the customer because they have that uh, spend already uh, uh, set up. Lastly, uh, it comes down to measurement. Uh, and many issues we see during the, the self-service or developer-first business models is integration and onboarding problems. So by being very diligent on tracking the onboarding flow, you can uh, identify those struggles and make the fixes as needed. Um, this is the recommended funnel that we uh, recommend tracking, which is starting off with that page visit and sign up. These are things that a developer does uh, right on your website as you're getting started. And then tracking things like time to first hello world and time to first working app. So that is the time to make that very first APA call, whether it's done through Postman or done through Crow or a different uh, tool. And then how long does it take for them to ship a fully working app to production, right? And this means they're actually sending significant volume through your API. What are the things to measure? Well, first is the conversion rate for each of these steps. You know, how many folks who sign up for your API end up sending that first API call? Is it 10%? Is it 50%? And how long does it take? Is it, you know, one hour or is it three weeks? Because if it is taking three weeks to get set up, you might want to take a look at, is, is that the right onboarding process? Is there additional things you can be doing to make it easier? Whether it's either SDKs, additional uh, documentation that be rolled out or different tutorials and videos that can reduce that time to first hello world time. And then you can start adding additional context to who these developers are. Because as you move towards this self-service model, you're no longer dealing with you know, hundreds of customers. You're gonna be having you know, hundreds of thousands of different developers, each with different languages that they're familiar with, different levels of education and experience levels, different channels that they might discover your API through whether it's through you know, Reddit or through Stack Overflow or even GitHub and different roles, right? I mean, a, a web, is it web developer? Is it a senior architect? Is it you know, a VP of engineering? So they each have different use cases, which may mean you need to even tweak your onboarding flow to meet those different needs and adjust that messaging accordingly. Once you add all these different pieces, you're able to slice and dice that funnel that I'm showing here. In this case, I am tracking that uh, conversion rate to make uh, their first purchase transaction. In this case, this is an e-commerce uh, API, rip to a slice and dice that by marketing channel. And we can see how does that compare against Reddit ads versus Facebook ads versus different email campaigns that we have going on. And this allows me to put more marketing dollars and sales dollars to the initiatives that make sense and not keep wasting money in areas that don't work for developers. If there's one key takeaway when it comes to monetizing an API, it is to deliver a great self-service onboarding. If you 
If you solve the onboarding problem and you solve the uh, support problem, then everything else falls in place. In this case, we recommend setting up a set of different emails and workflows to nudge developers in the right spot. Not every developer knows what is the next thing after they make that first specific call. Give them you know, some guidance, whether it's a video, case study, tutorial, and you can even make those adjustments based off of who the person is. You know, for example, a VP of engineering who's signing up to use your API, they may care more about you know, case studies and, and uh, metrics and, and other uh, success stories. Whereas a, a developer that is struggling to get started, they might just want to be looking at you know, a, a guide or tutorial, and they don't really care as much about those case studies. That's all I have folks today, but I hope you learned something about how to monetize your API and how to create a great developer experience. Thank you so much, Derek. I think it's very interesting because you really followed simple marketing patterns for a lot of this and SaaS applied SaaS techniques to APIs, which just makes sense because a lot of people are just struggling with the business side of APIs. I think also because APIs aren't always treated like a product, so they aren't given a product team. They're not giving a marketing person. It's the more technical people are trying to figure this out. So I think it was a really helpful technique. Um, and I think just pulling it full service, full circle with our API design theme that we've had, like obviously good documentation and SLAs are essential to have this happen. Um, one question. Talking about this. Yeah. One question I had was, do you need monetization? How do you know you're re obviously, like we said, you can't monetize, you can't improve, but you can't measure. So you have to have all these measurements in place anyway to understand how your API is doing. But how do you decide that it's the right time or even if you need API monetization? That's a good question. And it's not always an easy uh, one to answer in a couple of days. Um, if you have customers already saying, hey, I'm going to pay for your API, I just need access to the API, that's a really good sign that you can start monetizing. Um, but it really depends on the product. Is this an API first company or is this more of an API enable company? And one way to look at that is, is the developers signing up to use your API directly? And are they using it to access data or sending transactions through the API? And you don't have much of a, a GUI or UI um, for other business customers to be using? Or is your API there more for you know integration layer and 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 to have additional uh, 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 capabilities? In that case, maybe it doesn't make sense to be monetizing your API because most business customers are signing up to use your UI or or, or the tool itself. Um, but this is a discussion to be had, you know, within you know your product and business teams to say you know what parts are monetizable here, what parts are more of an additional feature that are included with that base plan. Do you need to have an API first mentality and design, or can you do code first design to still monetize APIs? That's a good question. You know, when it comes to monetizing APIs, you know, there's a lot of iteration involved. So you don't need to have, you know, everything set up uh, up front. With that said, um, monetizing is always a very delicate area. It's an easy way to piss off customers. So we do recommend having, you know, a plan of action uh, set up ahead of time and iterate on that, right? So for example, you know, you might start off saying we want the simplest uh, tiered SaaS pricing model and you just package the API access as part of that uh, tier. And later on, you add the, the usage-based component when, when you see customers saying, hey, I would pay a lot more, you know, uh, additional money just for the API by itself. I don't need any other features for the UI but I need a way to pay for this, right? And if you're too limiting with those traditional tiered SaaS pricing models, then maybe you're, you're leaving money on the table, off the table just because they, they can't get access to or, or solve their business needs, right? They wanna use the API, but they can't. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess part of it is you have to look at your, it's just like any marketing or business or expansion, like you have to look at your competitors and see what they're offering and if you need the API is something that will keep a customer and keep and just something to sweeten the deal or keep attrition going. Or if you need the API as you're trying to fund the API because you need it for another reason. Definitely. Absolutely. Um, 
what is the big mistake that people make when they're monetizing APIs or they're trying to monetize APIs? Where are they failing most? Are you seeing most often? The biggest one we've seen is the scalable uh, CSM models, um, in particular when it comes to building surprises. Uh, you know, people assume that people just want to, you know, uh, set it and forget it. But, you know, um, you know, no one wants to get that sticker shock and, and pay a $10,000 bill. And managing those expectations, making sure you get all stakeholders involved and they're ready to pay for, for that next uh, uh, tier or, 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 or level of service. Um, and being more proactive when it comes to supporting those different uh, uh, things that come up. Uh, rather than waiting for customers to say, hey, I got this $10,000 bill. I'm pissed off. What do I do? How do I remedy this? Otherwise, you're just going to be giving out a lot of uh, discounts and credits. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, that's why people have a love-hate relationship with the cloud, because there's always, with a certain vendor, um, there's always surprise billing and things like that. So do you need a developer portal or some sort of dashboard to set up API monetization so they have that transparency? I always believe in having a self-service way to audit their usage and transactions and everything else long term. In the short term, at least set up some type of notifications for your own team to know when people reach those certain thresholds. So you can reach out, say, hey, you know, we, we saw that you're, you're increasing your usage, maybe increase 10% week over week in, in terms of API calls. And uh, we can get you on a plan that makes sense. Maybe get a volume use discount or, or committed use discount or something like that. And then over time, you can build that additional functionality. Of course, we always love to talk talk about tools like MoSup, which can make this much easier for you because you just drop it in and you get you know uh, usage metrics, embedded API logs, and, and quota management built in. Um, but you know, it's it's an ongoing process, right? Like any product development, um, it's iterative. You mentioned Twilio and Stripe. They're a constant example or paragon of perfection for uh, APIs, but are there other companies we should be looking at for API monetization, et cetera? I love what Algolia is doing these days. Mm -hmm. um, they just shifted towards a new uh, pay go model. Uh, the way they present it and even downplaying, you know, the enterprise plans on the pricing page, I think is, is, is a great strategy there. Um, some other ones I can think of, uh, Tomato.io, which is one of our customers, They've been doing some uh, great things around uh, their API and you know how they ensure um, you know even if they deprecate a feature, make sure they, they uh, are very informative with their customers and and they never actually uh, turn off access. Right, um, they're always making sure there there's a way for them to manage those old customers. Um, Radar is another good example where they shifted towards a self service model, ensure they had the right measurement in place and be more proactive with their customers. Um, there's a lot more stuff behind the scenes than just what is on the website itself. And, and both Radar and, and Tomato IO have done leaps and bounds in terms of being extremely proactive with their customers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And let's be honest, nobody likes surprises with billing or anything else. That's a human factor. So that is across the board. Thank you so much, Derek. Uh, everybody that learned something, don't forget to tweet to hashtag API days.